In February of 1942, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which said that all people of Japanese descent were to be removed or excluded from the West Coast area. We were given a very, very short time to sell what we had uh, like a matter of hours, they did not want us to know where we were going. We really don't know much about the Azula floods until the mid-1920s. It was initially thought that these floods uh, were few. They took place uh, over a period of perhaps uh, a couple of hundred years, maybe. Turns out that there have been more than 110 documented floods. Even more interesting is the fact that they took place while this place was inhabited. And we have to remember that. I remember my mother telling me that my legs were black because in those days, girls didn't wear pants. They wore dresses and skirts. And so crawling around on the floor, of this shack that we were given to live in. Uh, it was all rough wood, and my legs were covered with slivers that my mother had to periodically take out the worst of them. Rivers uh, in the Northwest are uh, few compared to other places in the world. But the rivers that are here are on balance quite dramatic. The Columbia River main stem and the major tributaries, and that would include the Snake River, it would be the John Day River, it would include the Deschutes, and of course the Willamette and dozens of other streams. They're all snow charged. So there are very high and very low marks. So you've got a river, which is a dynamic part of the landscape to begin with, in a very dynamic mode, much different than, say, the Missouri, much different than the Ohio. These are rivers that flow enormous volumes, but they don't have this descent. The Columbia main stem itself falls a little over 2,200 feet in about 1,200 miles. The first 150 miles is flat, and the last 100 miles is flat. So in between those, approximately 900 miles, you have a river that's falling about three and a half feet per mile. What that means is that the Columbia main stem and the tributaries make it the single most potentially powerful hydroelectric river system on the face of the earth. I remember one time finding my grandmother in a pond with water up to here, and she was going around in that pond with a net, and she was picking the tiny, tiny fish that were swimming in there so they could dry and salt them to make something for us to eat other than hot dogs. In 1932, the Corps of Engineers finished its uh, survey of the Columbia River and identified major dam sites on the river. Among those dam sites is Bonneville Dam. 
the state of Oregon had said 20 years before that you can't build a dam anywhere without providing some way of allowing fish to move in the stream. And so they had to design a fish ladder on a major dam that had never been done before. They built this fish ladder, but in doing so, they had to recognize that they were going to kill fish. Those fish, salmon, steelhead, and others, have been at the center of human use of the river for a long, long time. Right now, the Corps and all of the other agencies estimate that about 10% of all of the fish descending the Columbia River are killed at each dam. Now, you can do the math on that. But when you are going through eight or nine or 10 dams, that's a lot of fish that aren't going to make it. It's very difficult to have a river system that's meant to flow and impound it and still make it hospitable to the animals, specifically those fish, that have been using it for millennia. It's one of the most important conflicts in this region. We could hear the radio. We could hear the songs played on the radio, the big bands. It was the big band era. And uh, we loved that music. Um, I still do. And it just meant a lot to us to be able to hear that music because we all felt we were just like other Americans. The Japanese people were inwardly outraged, but there was there was a sense of shame after we got out of camp and were settled in our homes around the area. And throughout those years, no one talked of camp. They were ashamed that they had been put into a prison. I know I've spoken with a lot of people who were appalled that this happened. They couldn't believe that this would happen in the United States. Well, it all boils down to racial prejudice. And for what Japan did at the time, people were able to look at a race and say, everybody's bad. When we talk about this sort of thing, I like to emphasize the really two common elements that have to do with uh, a place. One of them is a, a view that we might call vertical, where we look down on it and we see it in relation to other places that are physical or geographical or in some way uh, defined. And then another way is uh, a horizontal one, in which we're looking right through uh, the place, but mostly at what people are doing. And in that second one, is where you find uh, most of the meaning in a place because it's not just that a particular event happens or that people experience certain kinds of emotions or have a psychological, uh, one might say, consequence to being in a particular place. It's what that place is and exactly what is the relationship between those human feelings and the place that you're looking at.